Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Lukey, and my pronouns are he, him. I've worked at Box for the past seven years as a software engineer in application security, accelerated uploads, caching and database, and most recently, I've been working on Box Graph. Today, I'd like to share our journey to Redis, first from memcached to Redis, then from Redis to Redis cluster, and then I'd like to share some of the things that we've built using Redis. Finally, I'd like to end with operational learnings. And as part of the case studies, I'd like to showcase uh, a few things we've built, like our session store, uh, from uh, store to store to store, and recent files as a feature we've built, chunked uploads that uses Redis in a particular way, and finally, our rate limiter uh, service and framework that uses Redis. But first, what is Box? Box allows people to securely and easily share and collaborate content from anywhere on any device. It's used by 10 million people uh, across 82,000 organizations worldwide. Uh, and these are in virtually every industry in the world, ranging from finance to legal to manufacturing to health. And so there are a lot of really critical uh, use cases that these companies have they use Box for. So to talk about how we get to that kind of a scale, let's dive into the technology. Before Redis, there was Memcached in use as a session store at Box. So let's say a user comes to our site, they log in, we hand them back a session token, which is stored in their cookie jar in their browser, and we associate with that token their session information in Memcached. So in, in this example, we have, say, four Memcached servers, uh, and their session lives on the third one. What is wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this architecture? If the third server goes down, that user is logged out. So this is a, a SPOF, a single point of failure. So what do we do? We created a secondary tier so that any writes that went to this data store would be written both to the primary tier and to the secondary tier. So now we have the data in two places. So if there is a single point of failure, or a single node goes down, then we're able to mitigate that failure. Uh, the way it works is we write to both. Uh, when we read, we read from the primary. If the primary, uh, we have a miss or it's unavailable, we go and look in the secondary. So this is great from a single node failure point of view. But there were some problems, specifically around maintenance. If you imagine that you need to do maintenance on the secondary tier, let's say, uh, you're doing kernel patching, you're doing some upgrades, or some hardware failed. So you need to be able to take those nodes out of rotation. And this, this effectively clears the secondary tier, because there's no way to replicate from one memcache node to another. So let's say the secondary tier is empty. Uh, now our sessions live only in the primary tier, and we're dual writing them. So now they're being written over again into the empty tier. If we can let people stay logged in for 30 days, uh, and we need to do maintenance now on the primary tier, we have to wait a full 30 days before we can swap these tiers and do maintenance on the next set of uh, servers. So this is super painful. We have to wait weeks to do maintenance. So we were looking for a way that we could replicate this data. And so we looked at Redis. And with Redis, you have the ability to replicate from node to node. Memcached has no such option. Uh, a little bit more detail about the differences. Uh, Redis has a much richer feature set. Not only can it do the simple get, set, and delete that memcached can do, it can also do a lot more interesting and complex data structures like sorted sets, uh, bit fields, uh, and more. About the performance variance between these, memcached only supports order one complexity operations like get, set, and delete. Redis supports all of these, and they're equally as fast but you can do these other operations that take nonlinear, or sorry, non-constant time, like sorted set takes log n time. So the guarantees around performance or the differences uh, in performance depend on what you do in Redis. Next, the client in Redis can be a little bit more complex, but this is mostly transparent for most developers. Uh, so the client needs to know a little bit more or hold on to it more state as it's interacting with Redis. Uh, with memcached, the client is very simple. The command set is very simple. And finally, persistence. Uh, Memcached has no persistence options. It never writes to disk. Uh, 
um, whereas Redis has a configurable levels of persistence, which we'll talk about in a bit. So back to our situation with the session store. So we were able to replace memcached with Redis. We kept the same primary and secondary tier setup. And now, let's look what our, our migration uh, or maintenance looks like. Let's say our third node in the secondary tier has a problem, and we need to swap it out or we need to, to do kernel patching on it. So we start replicating from uh, the third in the primary, so P3, to a spare node. This replication gets set up, and then we're able to swap the spare with S3. So now our spare is in the secondary pool, and our S3 node is out of rotation. It's out of traffic. We still have replication flowing uh, between P3 and the spare. And as long as that's happening, writes do not uh, go to, are not accepted by the spare from the application. So we need to cut replication. And now at this point, both servers, P3 and the spare, are taking traffic and uh, are receiving writes. And our S3 node is now out of traffic. And we can do maintenance on it. That's great. So we were able to solve this hugely painful problem in our maintenance process. But we still have some problems. Data is not consistent between the primary and secondary tier. Nothing drives consistency between these two copies of data. So if data fails to write to one of these locations, it's now different in the primary than it is from the secondary. There are also some race conditions that can occur. If you can imagine deleting from this data store, you need to, say, first delete from the primary, then delete from the secondary. And if our read operation operates such that it uh, reads from primary and then on miss goes to secondary and fills in the primary, we could actually be mid-delete and some other read comes in and populates the primary while we're trying to delete from the secondary. If you swap those operations then delete from the secondary, you've reduced the window for a race condition, but things are still possible. You could still have a race condition. Lastly, this was still volatile storage. So in a power outage or in a coordinated restart of all nodes, you would lose all data in this in memory data store. So I'll talk about how we solve those in a little bit. But around this time, we were implementing uh, a feature called recent files. And it's pretty much as simple as it sounds. Uh, this is my recents on my phone. Uh, I've got a list of files and other content that I've accessed. And it's organized in most recent at the top, least recent at the bottom. And we wanted to have this feature be available on mobile and desktop and everywhere. The problem was, OK, where do we store that data? How do we store a set of data that needs to be organized in uh, some sorted way? And we saw, OK, Redis has sorted sets. So here's an example of how we use the sorted set. We can add items to the set using Z add. And then when we want to uh, query and get the data in sorted order, we can use Z rev range to get it in reverse order. So in this case, we were storing timestamps. And so we get everything with the greatest timestamp first followed by everything that's least recent. So this is great. We have a data store uh, that can do this, and it can do it very uh, efficiently. But we still have the problems of our dual-tier Redis setup. Um, if you imagine what happens in recents uh, if we don't have a consistent data store, uh, you could have a situation where we flip tiers, and because some recent file add was not, like a Z add did not make it to one of these stores, someone's recent uh, files could flicker when you flip the tiers. This would be a bad user experience. Uh, race conditions are still a problem, and especially volatile storage. Let's say we have uh, some coordinated restart happens of our, our res nodes, or we have a power outage. Everyone's recent files disappear. This would be terrible from a user point of view, because you're trying to get work done. You go to your recent files, and it's blank. That would be awful. So this was not a good store, this setup was not ideal for recent files. So th they couldn't use this, this uh, situation. So that's where Redis cluster comes in. Around this time, Redis cluster, like 1.0, had GA'd. And uh, people were saying good things about it. We were kicking the tires a little bit. And we decided to investigate, would this work for us? Would this work for the recent files feature? So first, what is Redis cluster? And I'm talking about the open source version uh, during this talk. Uh, it's a horizontally scalable way to have Redis instances form a cluster. So horizontally scalable means that we can continue to add nodes as we need more and more capacity. Auto data sharding. Redis cluster is able to partition and split data among the nodes 
uh, in a fairly uh, automatic way. We're also, it's also fault tolerant, which means we can lose a node, uh, our server can go down, and we still continue operating, and no data is lost. We're still highly available. Also, Redis cluster has a decentralized cluster management system. It uses a gossip protocol amongst nodes to coordinate on what the configuration of the cluster is, uh, and you can send any command to any cluster node in order to change the cluster to, to administrate it. There's no single node that's sort of like the orchestrator of the entire cluster. Every node participates. And finally, it requires cluster compatible client libraries. Because of the way that cluster works, the clients must be aware that they are talking to a Redis cluster. And we'll get into that in a bit. A little bit more about how the data sharding works in Redis cluster. Every key that you save into Redis cluster is associated with a hash slot. There are 0 through 16,383 slots in Redis cluster. And in this example, let's say we had three master nodes. Each master is owning approximately a third of all keys. Um, from every master, there can be replicas configured. So in this case at Box, we have two replicas for every master node. And if a master ever goes down, a replica takes the place of the, of the master and becomes the new master. And the nodes coordinate on whether or not uh, a master has gone down. So let's go back to our web application. We configured our clients to talk to only the master node in the cluster. So reads and writes only go to the master, and that's their single point of truth for data. So now, for data consistency, we don't have two tiers that are uh, not kept consistent. We have one source of truth, one place to read and write data uh, for a given piece of data, like a session token. Uh, but we also have the replicas available to take over from the master if the master fails. A little about persistence in Redis cluster. Um, so there are a couple options for persistence. One is called the AOF, or the append-only file. This uh, is written every single time you send a command, a write command, to Redis cluster. So if a Redis node receives a write, it will try to append it to this file. So this is a, a file that stays as up-to-date as it can uh, with all the commands that have come in to this instance. It's a little bit large, because if you set a key multiple times, you'll have multiple copies in that append-only file. Um, and also, there are three options on how to set the fsync uh, property for this feature. Uh, fsync flushes the, the file to disk. And the first option is always. This would mean for every single write you receive, always flush it to disk immediately before returning to the client, the client acknowledged. Uh, the other is every second. So once a second, you flush the disk. And the third option is no, which allows the operating system to use its default uh, for uh, flushing to disk, which is every 30 seconds uh, in our case. There's another way to persist data in Redis cluster, which is an RDB file. This is a snapshot that is very concise uh, and very efficiently stored and is useful for backup purposes. So because it's so small, uh, it's ideal for that. Uh, the unfortunate thing is when you do an RDB save, uh, the instance must fork, and this can have performance uh, degradation for your clients, anyone who's talking to that node. So we do the RDB saves only on our replicas on a cron that's every hour. So we don't want to interrupt the master, which is taking client requests. OK, so now we have our recent files feature, and we've implemented these things in Redis cluster. So the cluster is consistent from a data point of view. There's only one place to put that data. Uh, no race conditions, because we don't have these two tiers. And we have persistent storage. We have both the AOF enabled, as well as we're doing RDB snapshots. So recent files was the first feature to be built on top of Redis cluster at Box. And just to give some flavor, this cluster is 32 masters and 64 slave nodes. Each node is 25 gigabytes. And there are eight instances per host. Uh, because Redis is single-threaded, we get more bang for buck if we co-locate instances on a single host. Uh, and we also are operating in peak at about 12,000 requests per second, or about a billion requests per day. So now that we built this out for recent files, can we use Redis cluster to migrate our sessions so that we get all the same guarantees? Early on in our Redis migration, 
uh, for sessions to Redis cluster, we had a problem. And that problem was we saw much increased latency when we were trying to set a session uh, into the cluster. You can see that we saw, on average, six millisecond response latency, where we had seen less than, a sec less than one millisecond previously. So this was very puzzling. Also, our 99th percentile on this was 50 milliseconds. This was crazy bad latency. So we were saying, what, what is going on? What is causing this? Now, there are a number of ways to debug latency in Redis, which is fortunate. Uh, how many of you know that there was a latency, there's a latency doctor that you can invoke for Redis? So it kind of talks to you. It's kind of like a psychotherapist. It's pretty cool. Uh, it gave us the following advice, that we had um, transparent huge pages enabled, uh, which can impact uh, persistent uh, Redis instances. So we didn't know that. We turned it off. Uh, unfortunately, this had minimal impact on our particular latency situation. So we went to the next uh, debugging step, which was the Redis CLI has an intrinsic latency checker built in. When you run this, it can tell you how much intrinsic latency there is in your kernel or your environment. And this is especially important in virtualized environments where you have a hypervisor that may be taking time away from uh, your processes. Luckily, we run on dedicated hardware. Um, and for a 100-second sample window, we, saw, we clocked the max of uh, 172 microseconds for our intrinsic latency. So our environment was fast. That was not the problem. We next looked at the network. And using the client-side latency checker in the Redis CLI, we were able to determine uh, with a number of samples that we saw a max of one millisecond response time from our client to a given Redis server with an average response time of about 0.13 milliseconds. So the problem was not with our network. Our network was as fast as we expected it to be, didn't have bottlenecks or jitter, these issues. Next, we enabled the slow query log on our Redis instances. And this can be configured to record events that take place in Redis uh, that take longer than a certain amount of time, in this case, 10 milliseconds. When we did this, we then queried all of our masters to get their slow logs. And what we saw were two commands were, were taking longer than 10 milliseconds. One was psync at about 15 milliseconds. Now, psync is an internal command that's used uh, when Redis replicas are subscribing to a master. They're asking the master, hey, I'd like to synchronize or partially synchronize with you um, to get up to speed on my replication stream. Now, this takes a long time, 15 milliseconds, but it doesn't happen that often. So this isn't really going to be that impactful. We have a limited number of replicas per master. This is not happening all the time. Cluster slots was taking 38 milliseconds. Now, cluster slots is potentially happening much more frequently than psync. So first, I have to talk a little bit about what is cluster slots. Uh, let's say we're the web application. And at time zero, we know that there are two nodes uh, in Redis cluster. We know their addresses. There are nodes A and B. Those are our seed nodes. Before we can make a request to the cluster, our client has to update uh, its understanding of what the configuration of the cluster is. Since cluster configuration is dynamic and maintained by the cluster, we have to ask the cluster for cluster slots. It responds back with the, the nodes that own each uh, slot range. So in this case, A owns 0 through 5500, and so on. And so then at T2, we can fetch the key that we want to fetch. And we do this calculation to determine, as a client, which hash slot uh, owns our key, which is 14,687. And you can see that this is owned by node C in its range. And so now we're able to go directly to that node and to get my key. So now that we know how cluster slots works, what is going on with our latency problem? How is this related? If we go back to our, our user request and our web application, um, it turns out that this particular web application only uh, does work as long as it needs to, to fulfill the user request, and then uh, it's terminated. So these are very short-lived server processes. And what happens when we get another user request is every single time we have to do cluster slots first, followed by retrieval of the key that we wanted. And this is happening thousands of times per second. Every single time, our web application is not able to use the cluster slots that was previously fetched. And so we're doing a lot of redundant work. Ideally, we'd like to do one cluster slots request at the very beginning of startup, and then remember the result of that slot request. 
so that we can do subsequent lookups uh, for most of uh, the work that we want to do. And this should amortize the cost that it takes to do these sorts of requests. So on average, most requests should be fast. Also, the cluster can reconfigure itself at any time. So we need to account for that. Uh, if there's a moved response because the cluster, like a node has gone down or we're doing maintenance, as a reaction to that moved response, we have to refresh our cluster slots. So we did this by storing the cluster slots in the local APC cache on the web application server. So this is a PHP accessible cache. This application happens to be written in PHP. And it, when we did this, we saw our latency drop from six milliseconds down to lower than one millisecond. So this really solved our latency problem. It was the root cause. OK. Next, I'd like to cover a couple of other use cases, places we've used Redis at Box to build some interesting capabilities for our customers. And the first is chunked uploads. At Box, we have some extremely uh, large files that are uploaded to Box, usually by media and entertainment companies. These are folks in Hollywood that have insane file sizes. And the thing about file uploads is the larger the file, the more likely it is for that upload to fail, because that connection will more likely be interrupted. And this is due to a number of factors, but we also live in a much more mobile world. So our devices are switching networks all the time from Wi-Fi to cellular. Um, and also, we're closing our laptops, walking to the next meeting, opening up our laptops. And during that time, our network connections are being interrupted. So we can't upload one large file on a single connection. We need to split it up. So one way to do that, you can split up a file into chunks. Upload each chunk could be in parallel. And then when a chunk fails to upload, retry it. Now, there's also some, back, some processing that needs to happen uh, on the back end at Box, processing each chunk. And this is a, is a distributed system, so we need a way to track progress. And luckily, there's a very, very space efficient way to do that in Redis. It's called Bitfield. So in our upload example, we had three chunks. And you can see here the first chunk and the last chunk have made it. Uh, and we know that from that zero, our second chunk needs to be processed. So we're able to process it, and now we have all of our chunks processed. Now, I did mention previously that our AOF setting could uh, maybe lose up to 30 seconds worth of writes. In this situation, the processing that we're doing in the background is idempotent. So if we lose a write to this data store in Redis cluster, we just redo the work. And since it's idempotent, there's no ill effects. So this is still an OK use case for uploads. Your uploads are safe. Uh, another interesting fact, if you had 100 chunks uh, in a file, that would only take 13 bytes in Redis memory. And with the millions of file uploads that Box gets, uh, this is super important for us to be efficient because we have so many uploads. Um, and this is a huge win for us. Lastly, one of my favorite use cases, which is rate limiting. Uh, how many of you uh, run a site that needs something to be protected uh, with a rate limiter? There are a few. All right, rate limiters are super important in a lot of different cases, and especially at Box. Uh, one is to mitigate login abuse. So an attacker gets their hands on 100,000 usernames and passwords from some insecure database. They're going to run it against your site and try every username and password to see which ones have been shared across sites, some user that uses the same password everywhere. To mitigate against that, we need to limit or rate limit the attempts to log in that fail. And so we do that at Box with our rate limiters. So people cannot get through their list of passwords effectively. Another thing is you have an external endpoint, your API. Um, and you want to mitigate abuse from the API. Let's say you allowed developers to do uh, 1,000 requests per second. Maybe it's a very performant API. But you don't want them to exceed that, because that would impact uh, other users. So someone is hammering your site doing 2,000 requests per second. You need a way to rate limit them and tell them to back off. And lastly, you can enable internal quality of service. If you have microservices that are doing actions on behalf of a user or enterprise, they're talking to a, uh, a resource that's expensive, like a database. Uh, and you want to protect the experience for, a given, uh, for every user and every enterprise. If there's one really busy user or enterprise, you need to be able to rate limit them to protect that backend database so that you can have internal quality of service for all of your microservices. So one way to do this is with the leaky bucket algorithm. 
the way that this works is let's say we have uh, a use case where we want to limit an entity to 10 requests per second. Um, so we have a bucket that can leak at a rate of 10, say, units of water per second. We also want them to be able to burst up to 20. If they haven't done anything in a while, uh, they can do 20 requests all of a sudden, and that is OK. So what this looks like is, let's say we have a bucket that's got 15 out of a total uh, max capacity of 20, and a request from this entity comes in. We want to see, OK, leak the bucket, um, and then is there room for this request in this bucket? If there's room, we update the bucket, and we let the uh, user know that they're allowed. Um, and we, we allow them to do their action. In the case the bucket is full, we want to reject that user query um, because they're now over the limit. And in reality, we actually need to find a way to store this bucket somewhere. Uh, so for example, we have all these fields. Uh, the level of this bucket was 15 from the earlier example out of a max of 20. Uh, we're able to have a 10 per second rate, so that's 1 over 10 is their leak rate. And then this is an implementation detail we're going to store the last leak time. Um, that's because if we're going to be able to allow the bucket to leak at 10 per second, we don't actually want to send 10 requests per second to our Redis cluster for every bucket uh, to be able to do some math and decrement it. We're going to do it lazily. We're going to do that leaking operation at the time we access the bucket using this last leak time. So let's imagine we have two clients. They're both uh, trying to access the rate limiter um, backend. And so, uh, they're trying to, uh, I guess, get the bucket out of storage first, so they do a read. Then they're going to try to update the bucket um, and add their request to the bucket, update the bucket, uh, and finally save that bucket back to the store. So what's wrong with this picture? Imagine this bucket is near full, and it only has room for one more request in it before it caps out. So two clients simultaneously do a read-read, then update independently in the client and then save back to the store. We've now missed an update and allowed two operations to occur, to allow, uh, when we should have only allowed one. So we missed an update. Now you could say, let's just add a check and set. Instead of save, we'll do a check and set, and only one of these will succeed. Um, the client A will fail their check and set because the value has changed on the server from the time that they loaded it. Now this client has to go back to step one, do a read, update, and then check and set again. And with regular lat latencies on the network, this whole loop could take two milliseconds. And what does that mean for your total throughput in a rate limiter situation? You can only do this 500 times a second if it takes two milliseconds to do a successful update. And we're trying to, su uh, we're trying to support levels of thousands of requests per second. So this isn't going to work. Luckily, Redis has Lua. Uh, a Lua interpreter on the server side. So what we can do is we can atomically leak the bucket, update the counters, and then return allow and deny in a single request. And since Redis is single-threaded, and Lua also subscribes to this notion, um, we're never going to miss an update. So if we do our update with Lua, all of this happens on the server side atomically. We don't miss any updates, and our rate limiter is super accurate. And in production, we've been able to achieve uh, 60,000 requests per second for this rate limiter. So it's able to handle that level of load and provide uh, this level of rate limiting uh, for our use cases. Lastly, I wanted to share some operational learnings. So you only find out what happens in reality when you put things into production. Um, and one of those things is maintaining the Redis cluster. Uh, at Box, we have a number of Redis clusters. And our ops team has built uh, this Redis cluster manager, uh, which is written in Python and allows us to uh, simplify a lot of Redis cluster operations, things we need to do day to day. We constantly have to patch our, our systems, upgrade our kernels. And so this allows our ops team to very easily do this kind of maintenance and day to day operations with the cluster. Uh, it automates Redis Trib, um, which is a tool that you can use to do cluster operations. And just to give you a sense of one of these operations and how it works, Let's say we need to do maintenance on a master node, which is A1. Uh, we need to patch it, or it needs some sort of hardware maintenance. So the first thing we need to do is to fail over this master instance. So in this case, A2 became the master, and now A1 is uh, a replica. The second thing we need to do is remove A1 from seed nodes. 
Uh, the seed nodes are what are exposed to our clients. They're what allow our clients to know about uh, nodes in the cluster. And so we need to uh, cut off clients from knowing about this uh, node A1. Next, we need to ask the cluster to forget or evict A1 from the cluster. Uh, so that it's no longer taking traffic, it's no longer part of uh, voting on things in the cluster. And finally, now that it's out of traffic, we can finally do maintenance. When we're done doing maintenance, we can ask the cluster to merge A1 back into the cluster and make it part of it. And then an important last step is to add A1 back to the seed nodes uh, so that clients can be exposed to this cluster node. The seed nodes nuance is important because any node in the cluster can respond to cluster slots. So even if uh, your node is, say, a, a replica node, it still may be asked what, its what the cluster slots are for the whole cluster, because clients usually pick any, any node in the seed nodes, ask for cluster slots. Also a word of warning, uh, and this has bitten us a few times at Box. Client libraries differ. No, they're not all made the same. So if you have a client library in a, two different languages or several different languages, they will operate differently uh, and in nuanced ways. So for example, uh, we were using the Redis Scala client library uh, in Scala, and we noticed that it had strict seed node requirements. Uh, what this meant was we had a cluster that reconfigured itself, or we pulled a node out, uh, but the seed nodes had not been updated. Um, and so clients were trying to connect to a node that was not part of the cluster, um, but the seed node, it wasn't in the list of seed nodes. Um, so even though the cluster knew that this node was part of the cluster, say, uh, the client was trying to connect to it, but Redis Scala did not allow that to happen. So super strict about you cannot talk to anyone outside of your seed nodes. Uh, the Lettuce client doesn't update cluster slots by default, and this bit us recently. So let's say the cluster reconfigures, Lettuce, by default, does not do a cluster slots operation uh, to update seed nodes, or sorry, update its local cluster slots understanding uh, when there's a change. Um, so this results in mismatch in what the reality is and what you're able to talk to for the master. Uh, lastly, some clients may read from slave nodes. If you noticed earlier, we had decided we wanted to configure all of our clients to only talk to master nodes. So this was for good data consistency, read after write, um, someone found out that one of our clients was reading from a slave node, and this broke some of the guarantees that they had thought that they had in their application, because there was a lag between the time they saw their data from the master and on the slave. So there was, uh, some data was lost, it, it seemed, but actually it was just replicating. So in conclusion, what did we build? We've migrated a session store from memcached to standalone Redis to Redis cluster, We've built uh, the recent files feature across all of our uh, mobile and desktop applications, and it uses the sorted set as its data structure. We built chunked uploads and uses, using bit operations to track progress. And we built a rate limiting service and framework that uses Lua for super high performance rate limiting operations. And we've overcome some challenges. We had really painful maintenances in the beginning with memcached as a session store that we now don't have. Uh, we've eliminated data inconsistencies that used to occur, as well as race conditions when doing delete operations. And we've turned from a volatile key value store to a persistent one. And we've solved latency issues that were regarding cluster slots in a legacy application. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge some folks. First. Salvatore Sanfilippo for writing Redis, uh, Redis and Redis Cluster and continuing to work on this great piece of software. Redis Labs for hosting the event and for having me here. And our caching, caching dev and ops teams who are in the audience here. Uh, thank you guys so much for making this uh, all possible, what I've presented. And lastly, if these uh, problems sounded interesting to you, Box may be for you. These are some of the most passionate, talented, and genuine people I've ever worked with. And if you want to apply your skills and grow them in a place like this, I highly recommend going to box.com slash careers. Thank you. Yeah, hey.
Uh, for your rate limiter application, did you look at using the increment uh, command instead of using Lua? Uh, I believe we did. There are some extra features that I didn't show in this particular implementation. We actually have a way uh, of blocking, like freezing a bucket for some amount of time. Um, if there's a particularly egregious, um, I guess, uh, client that's, that's using the rate limiter, um, you can imagine someone who's attacking uh, our service and trying to log in. Um, we don't want them to make incremental progress like, and basically figure out what the rate limits are and just make requests um, at the, that boundary, right when they get uh, shut down. If they exceed this limit frequently or ever, we would actually like to freeze the bucket and make sure that they can't use uh, or do their operation for an extended period of time. And to do that, we have some extra fields that we set, and the, the Lewis script helps us uh, do that math and those operations. Makes sense. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, the sessions use case that you had, uh, what's the heuristic you had for, the, for calling cluster slots? Uh, because you're actually benefiting from just calling it once, and then, and then you're actually seeing the amortized gain, right? Sorry, can you repeat that a little louder? For the sessions application, you're actually calling cluster slots only once, and then you're storing it in your, uh, your web, web, app, web application side of things. How often do you call this cluster slots once again to get the latest state of the cluster? Sure, it's not a polling operation. So as long as we have cluster slots cached in our web application, we actually keep it cached with no expiration and no periodic refresh, like interval, until we receive a moved uh, response. Uh, when you try to get a key in Redis cluster, you'll normally get the information, but you may sometimes re receive a moved response with the IP and port of the server that should own that, because the cluster has updated its, its understanding of the cluster topology. When you get that moved response, that means your cluster uh, client now knows, OK, I need to refresh. I have an outdated cluster slot because I'm talking to the wrong owner. Um, so that's when you do cluster slots, request again to the cluster, and that's when we know to write it in cache and overwrite our previous cache value. Uh, hey, I have a follow-up question uh, for the uh, rate limiter as well. So two things. First of all, when you define, when you configure that configuration file you showed, so is it like a per host or is it per cluster or is it like a per your entire service scale? That's one. Second thing is I'm just curious, like why, like under the cover, under the hood, how does Lua actually solve the problem? Does it put a log or is it like autonomic, like CPU level integer increment type of thing? Like why it's magically solved the problem? OK, so for your first question, how do we configure our rate limiters? Um, there is uh, another place where we store those and we define them to be used. So for example, uh, you could have an um, IP-based um, set of rate limiter configuration that says, OK, for any, any IP that's, that's using uh, my service, I'm going to have the following buckets set up. Um, so that might be in a configuration file. It might be in another database that your application loads from. Um, and so that's where uh, you would load buckets. And the buckets are generally like, uh, you won't just have one IP-based bucket. You might have a key that's based on IP. And so it would be IP underscore bucket. And then you'd have a lot of these different buckets. Um, but they would all be this IP type of bucket. And they would source their configuration from that place, uh, like that database where you put like 10 and 20. That's the, the leak rate and the uh, max capacity. For your second question, um, let's see. It was, uh, actually, can you repeat your second question? <laughs> Lua. OK, how does Lua, Lua do that? Yes, how, yeah, does how, does, Lua how does Lua do that? So um, Redis being single threaded means that uh, it actually does not have to take a lock on anything. Um, Redis, what it's doing is uh, taking one request after the other. And now these are usually very fast. Um, but Redis even acknowledges that Lua scripting could get you in trouble and end up with a very slow data store. If your Lua operation takes long, long enough, let's say it takes 50 milliseconds, because you're doing some n squared operation, it takes a long time, uh, a lot of requests are going to block on that, uh, because the Lua request gets uh, to operate in this single-threaded way. Uh, so there's only ever one R Lua script that's running at any given time, never two in parallel, accessing or modifying things. Um, so they actually put a cap on, you can configure how long a Redis or sorry, a Lua script can run for. 
before it's cut off uh, and it's failed. Uh, most times you're going to write Lua scripts that are going to execute like order one type operations constant time. Uh, so they're going to be as short as many, maybe every other uh, Redis operation. And Lua is actually very fast. The interpreter is quick. I believe it compiles your Lua and caches it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that you have multiple Redis cluster clusters. I was wondering if you, you use different ones for each of the use cases you elaborated, or if you have some other way of allocating use to clusters. Uh, sure. How do you think about that? Thank you. Sure. So uh, we do have multiple clusters. Uh, usually, every use case gets its own cluster. For example, um, you wouldn't want to co-locate the sessions cluster with maybe the rate limiter cluster, because um, some, some of that, uh, those data use cases and those access patterns might step on each other. And you wouldn't want to also uh, have one failure condition. So like, if your rate limiter store goes down, that is also the session store. You want to have those be isolated uh, like failure conditions so that people can still log in even if like, the rate limiter system is having some trouble. Um, there are cases where we co-locate uh, use cases into the same cluster. Generally, when they're related um, or they're very, very small use cases, we can co-locate uh, into another cluster. Yeah. It also helps with metrics if you have metrics set up on your cluster to know that this is like the, the numbers that you're seeing or the graphs that you're seeing the spikes in are definitely because of some login traffic or definitely because of some rate limiter traffic. And you don't have to guess about which use case it was. Do you replicate across uh, data centers? Let's say you have one Redis cluster in West Coast, the other Redis cluster in East Coast. And do you have a use case for that? And how do you manage to do it? Sure. Currently, we do not replicate across regions. Um, mostly, Redis is used uh, at Box Day similar to a cache. Um, and so we would see people, let's say, if they wanted to log in uh, and their, their request went to a different data center, it's most likely they'd, they'd perform a new login there. Um, right now, uh, Box doesn't have uh, like active, active, multi-region data centers. It's either one or the other. Um, but I think we will get there. And we're probably going to implement that with some sort of like Kafka pipeline uh, or something that is able to populate our Redis clusters or at least keep them synchronized in some eventually consistent way, similar to most master-master databases. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, more about what your session cluster looks like? Um, how large it is? Are you using the open source version or the enterprise version? Can you? Sure. We're using the open source version of Redis cluster. Um, and let's see, for that particular store, I think it's similar to the, recents, uh, the recent files cluster. So I think it's uh, probably in the ballpark of several hundred gigabytes of cache. Um, yep, it's probably very similar. I think it's very similar to the size of our, our previous cluster. I think it has more traffic, though. I think it takes more requests per second. Um, oh, one fun stat. I added up all the like, Redis cluster operations per second. Um, you saw that the, the numbers I had on the recent files was 12,000 requests per second. Overall at Box, uh, it's 10x that, so 120,000 requests per second. Um, or I guess 10 billion operations a day. Coming from uh, a talk from Lyft, uh, th there was some mention about Redis cluster, not the open source version of it not being uh, stable or not many customers using it. Have you had any issues at all uh, with the clients talking to the cluster and getting some consistency issues or any of those things? Sure. We haven't had many, many issues. And a lot of people are scared away by talk of like the cluster, open source cluster isn't stable. Uh, we have not had... Uh, those sorts of problems. Um, we've seen, yeah, I, th I think very few problems due to uh, any sort of server-side Redis cluster implementation problems. Thank you. I have a question again. Uh, actually, two. Uh, the first one is, uh, can you speak about how uh, did memory estimations for the Redis clusters? That's one. And it may vary with different use cases. Uh, the second thing is, uh, because you're using the open source version, if I'm not wrong, are you using, uh, what's the, uh, how do you solve the HA high availability problem? Are you using Sentinel here or something else? Okay. Uh, all right. So actually, let me do second question first. So 
we are not using Sentinel. Uh, to get high availability, uh, when a master goes down, there's a configurable amount of time uh, that all the other nodes that are gossiping uh, agree that uh, a cluster should time out, a, a node should time out with. So like say 10 seconds, if you haven't heard from a master in 10 seconds, we all agree that it's down. Once you have a quorum on that, uh, the nodes promote a slave to be the new master. Um, and so in this way, you have a fairly high, highly available setup. So you may have lost uh, some writes that went to this master when it froze or died. Um, but that's the best you can do in this kind of situation. Uh, we're not like dual writing somewhere uh, in case there's one, one node that goes down. And in a lot of our use cases, that's uh, very appropriate. Um, the first question, how do we estimate memory? Um, a lot of it is we try to estimate. We have like a questionnaire that we give uh, other engineers when they say, we need Redis. How, like, and we ask how much, and they're like, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so we ask them, OK, what's your average size of key? and value, uh, how many need to be in cache or in memory at any given time, what's your read rate, what's your write rate? Because you not only need to calculate uh, the size of cache, like how many gigabytes, memory is pretty cheap. Bandwidth can be expensive. That would determine the number of nodes that you need because each one has a network interface that can be saturated. And if you want to run with some level of availability in case a few go down, you need more uh, network and probably need to operate under 100% network utilization. So we try to get a sense of how big the data is going to be, as well as how much network are they going to need, um, especially like bursts, like they need a, a burst of traffic. You want to be able to support that without dropping packets. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I think if, uh, if cluster do scale out and uh, the shading. Uh, when cl um, clients <coughs> do cluster slot in new method. Uh, sorry, one more time. Mm. The, does the client? <coughs> when client do cluster slot in new method. Yeah. If we do scale out and the shading. OK. Um, I got that as uh, when you're scaling out a cluster, uh, what clients do you use? Uh, so like what client libraries do we use, or which languages? Uh, Python and oh, Java. Pi Python and Java? Uh, we use Java. We use Scala. Um, we use Node.js. And we use PHP. So we, we've used clients in all of these languages, but we did have to modify the PHP one for our particular use case uh, due to this uh, cluster slot situation. Thank you. There's a list, actually, of clients uh, that work really well on uh, the Redis cluster, or Redis, Redis uh, I think it's the lab's website that's got all the documentation of uh, clients that have like stars next to them. They're like, these work pretty well. And the ones without stars are like, oh, OK, they might work for you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Ryan.